Hello. Well, welcome. Welcome to our video session on what is active learning. Um, today, this is uh, me, Dr. Victoria Shabib, and Dr. Mike Ross. So I'm an assistant professor of educational leadership in the Department of Counseling, Educational uh, and School Psychology and Educational Leadership in the College of Applied Studies. And Dr. Ross will introduce himself. I'm uh, Mike Ross from the Department of Sport Management in the College of Applied Studies. And uh, I'm an assistant professor there and the graduate coordinator. Wonderful. So um, today we would like to talk to you a little bit more about what is active learning um, and provide you a couple of examples of how we utilize, how we employ active learning strategies, practices in our classroom. So, um, um, all right. The first and foremost objective is to um, define what active learning is. Well, uh, you probably heard um, the term active learning every so often, hopefully. And um, active learning is currently defined as any approach to instruction in which all students are asked to engage in the learning process. So there are multiple uh, key pieces to active learning, which include student engagement, uh, student-centeredness, um, engagement them in the critical thinking and hands-on practice. The essential outcome and the critical outcome of active learning is to develop a long-term recall and deeper understanding of the information learned in the classroom. So um, active learning stands out from traditional learning modes or traditional instructional modes by actual, actually switching students' um, status from passive learners, passive recipients of the information uh, to um, in actively engaging them in the learning of presented materials. So um, that would include you know, engaging students, motivating students to learn more, to read more, to practice their skills, to apply their knowledge to new settings, to new environments, but also uh, engaging them in uh, the higher order analysis, higher order thinking, uh, critical analysis of the information, um, and also engaging them in obtaining information obtaining more information and leading um, the skill and knowledge acquisition on their own terms. So um, active learning essentially can take many forms and can be executed uh, or observed in any discipline. Um, in a discipline of education and social sciences, we see a lot of situations um, where active learning can be actively um, implemented. So um, the way uh, we can engage students in active learning is by inviting them to participate in small or large activities, you know, centered around writing, talking, problem solving, or um, reflecting and self-reflecting. So active learning is actually um, some kind of a systemic, more um, interconnected, um, approach to instruction, you know, that promotes uh, students' knowledge acquisition, analysis of knowledge and synthesis, and um, invites them to kind of deepen that understanding um, and transfer the knowledge that they acquired to the environments and settings and problems that they've never experienced before. So um, yeah, right now we will talk a little bit more about what active learning might look like in practice in um, in the classroom settings, and um, Mike will will take it from there. Thanks, Victoria. So I'm going to share just kind of a little bit of a case study of the active learning experience that I've had in class, uh, and this was uh, several years ago, but. Um, 
this project that the students engaged in during the class um, actually happened by accident. Uh, it was not intended, so I am not the brilliant mind behind all of it. Um, I just kind of stumbled into it. Uh, the project itself is a social media campaign uh, that my sport public relations class uh, engages in every semester. And this particular project this year was actually a active solution to a problem. In the past, I had students work on uh, fictional campaigns to uh, promote a student athlete for Heisman uh, or the Naismith Award in the spring during college basketball season. That's basically the Heisman Trophy for uh, college basketball students. The problem that I had this particular semester and uh, ultimately what ended up being the, the year, both semesters, uh, is that I had a Naismith finalist in my class. Uh, now, before I came over to the academic side, I spent 10 years over in the athletic department. Uh, so I knew that having one of our student athletes promote himself for a national award was a really bad idea. Uh, and then what was worse was the potential of this particular student athlete promoting a student athlete at another school for a national award. So I knew I was going to have to come up with something a little bit different. So this assignment was born. Uh, the students engaged in a real life social media campaign uh, that attempted to build support to convince a small television network in Bristol, Connecticut that you might've heard of before, uh, ESPN, to bring their weekly traveling college basketball preview show that aired every Saturday morning uh, for a couple of hours during college basketball season before all the games of the day began, and ultimately bring that show to Wichita. Uh, so we divided the students up into groups, uh, and what happened from this was really fairly remarkable uh, because the first thing that I noticed was they were bought in, uh, they were engaged, and they were actually excited about coming to class. So I had to completely flip the model of what we were doing. Uh, it was no more, no more lectures, no more things like that. It was literally just them coming to class, and we ultimately began discussing what was going on. So each group would run a piece of the social media presence, if you will, a platform. Uh, a group would take Facebook for two weeks, a group would take Twitter for two weeks, and then they would rotate throughout the, the rest of the semester. And what ended up happening was we were actually dealing with real life situations, real life numbers, you know, data that we're getting back here, uh, the day-to-day -day psychology of social media and how you are making connections to people and how you are trying to convince them to do it. And everything that is in our public relations book basically came to life for them because they were learning it without actually knowing that they were learning it. So they were saying um, an example would be, uh, you know, a group of people that deal with an organization in a similar way is called a public. Well, they were noticing that there were a lot of diehard shocker fans uh, getting on the social media platforms and engaging and commenting and liking and, and all the other things that you can do on all the other platforms. Uh, so instead of a lecture about publics and definition of a public, things like that, these conversations really allowed them to think critically uh, about the concepts that were in the textbook that they were reading about. Um, I have never ever seen a class uh, do as much reading in the textbook as this class did uh, because they would come to class and say, I read in the textbook about this. How does that apply to what it is that we're doing? Um, and it was two chapters ahead of where they were supposed to be. So they were doing their own research. They were doing their own knowledge gathering and really thinking critically 
about every piece of the puzzle that they were doing. Um, word got out about this. It, uh, it kind of got out of control a little bit. Um, we had tens of thousands of people that liked the uh, Facebook page, the Twitter accounts, the YouTube, and, and everything uh, was just going kind of too good. Um, you know, the, the students were picking up on concepts, uh, things that I was taught in advanced classes at the master's level uh, about public relations. They were making those connections on their own. Uh, and they didn't need someone to teach them. They were actually figuring it out on their own and, and applying it in the terms of their content that they were producing for the social media site. So really, instead of being the one that fostered all of the content out, um, I was able to sit back and kind of watch quietly as they really developed critical thinking and were able to demonstrate uh, sociology and psychology. Uh, and communication efforts all through social media. And they were able to connect all of these dots, not only just in my class, but in some of the classes that they took in their general studies time as well. Uh, things like sociology, psychology, you know, they were really getting into the heads of these people. The quality of their work was absolutely incredible. They produced ideas that made me take a step back at times. Uh, and there were times that I kind of had to rein them back in. In fact, uh, there was a rumor going around in a class uh, one session that uh, one of the groups was actually trying to rent animals from the zoo to make an appearance at an event that they had scheduled to try to drum up support uh, for the campaign. Uh, we nixed that fairly quickly. Uh, we don't need any uh, any zoo animals showing up in rentals or anything like that. But it goes to show you what could happen as this thing really snowballs uh, and they get more and more and more excited about the concepts that they're learning and how they are applying it. So the thought of active learning is great, but if any of you are like me, you want something that shows that it's actually making a difference. Now, the numbers that you see on the slide here are not completely empirical. We're not running regression analysis on this or anything, uh, but I do think numbers deserve a seat at the table. So I want to share with you uh, three pieces of information that I think we found fairly interesting about this class uh, in relation to others that we have taught. When we began the project in earnest and it began to really gather steam, uh, attendance absolutely skyrocketed. In the opening two weeks of class, our attendance was somewhere uh, around 88, 89%. Uh, the same class was taught again in fall of 2019 without this campaign. Uh, and the attendance for that class over the course of the entire semester was 82%. The second impact that we saw was a fairly sharp increase in grades in the class. Now, you can argue several theories as to why this is, but I observed two fairly big ones. The first one was that there was greater class engagement. Uh, not only were they coming to class more, but there was literally something for everyone. If you are not tech savvy with social media, no problem. Bring your creativity to the table. Uh, if you work 40 hours a week and you have very, very little time outside of class to dedicate to assignments and everything, perfect. You're going to help with the evaluation after each platform is completed and we go on down the road. Um, so it was literally, there was something there for everyone. And I think that that engagement was because of the project and how it individualized the experience for each of the students and tapped into their strengths. The second aspect of this is peer pressure. I know that can be a really negative motivating factor, uh, but we are in sport over here and we are ultra competitive. So this was actually a big part of why things were successful, I think. Um, for instance, one group had a student whose father owned a local printing company here. Uh, so that group went out and printed signs with the hashtag on it that they were using and brought them to class. The other groups were absolutely seething mad when they saw this. 
if I had a dime for every time I walked around the room in our meetings and heard, you saw what that group did, we need to step our game up. I would not be giving this presentation as part of my job. I would be on a beach somewhere uh, because it happened a lot. They were ultra competitive with each other. Um, so, you know, it just really drove home how much investment they had into their learning. And I think that those were a couple of side effects. And the class GPA uh, for that semester was 362. The class GPA for fall 19 uh, was right around 3.25. Uh, so there is a significant difference there. And then the last piece of information here, of course, comes from the SPTE scores. Uh, the course was rated high on the course value and the perceived quality index, uh, which you always see on the front page of the SPTE results. While many of you may get these results on a semester by semester basis, that was not necessarily the trend for this class. Uh, but since that point and since this project, those scores have improved quite a bit. Um, we have done similar things in other classes. Uh, we worked within Trust Bank Arena uh, to try to convince the UFC to bring a fight to Wichita, and that ended up happening. Uh, and we had a graduate class that actually built a campaign to try to convince Whataburger uh, to come to Wichita. Now, if you've heard the news lately, uh, Whataburger has announced that they are coming to Kansas. I don't know if it's going to be Wichita or not, but the vice president for marketing at Whataburger actually joined the LinkedIn group that they had created uh, and interacted with a couple of the students. So um, those types of experiences are really, to me, what active learning ultimately is all about. Absolutely. Um, so I also have a um, fairly short example of how um, I use, utilize active learning approach in one of my classes. This is an undergraduate level course and the course focuses pre predominantly on um, helping students learn a little bit more about information technology and in essentially to increase their information literacy. So this class has many different aspects and um, does center around the development of their critical thinking skills and um, recognition of um, personal and media bias. So one of the assignments, um, this is a highly interactive course, highly paced course and um, uh, requires a lot of critical and creative thinking. Even at the beginning of the course, students start reflecting on um, whether they are more critical thinkers or creative thinkers and so forth. So in a way, um, one of the assignments for this course was to create an infographic. And um, in order for them to do that, they had to learn um, kind of some foundational skills. They had to learn about how to recognize bias, how to evaluate information sources that are included, you know, in displayed information, visually displayed information that, that is publicly available. Then they had to evaluate the authority of people who uh, presented the, the information. They also had to evaluate the accuracy of the information, the timeliness of the information um, that's being presented. Either way, uh, in addition to the development of the critical thinking, as I uh, said previously, they also wanted to learn a little bit more about the information design and the role of different uh, design aspects, such as uh, the power of color, the power of, let's say, information organization, where we place, you know, our, our visual components, let's say, on, uh, on the slides and that kind of stuff. They also they, they, they were also very interested and very self-driven to learn about how different colors um, help one to translate the message or empower and force the message to the audiences that they want to engage and how that actually helps them engage the the, um, the targeted audiences. So that class included all kinds of students from all kinds of disciplines, you know, 
uh, I had students uh, who were pursuing profession in nursing and I had some you know uh, future teachers elementary middle school high school teachers lots of people from sports management lots of folks from you know computer uh, IT um, librarians that kind of stuff so um, having an assignment that um, would be really really relevant to their fields because uh, designing information to designing an infographic excuse me to present the information that would inform um, certain aspect of their profession was something that we're really really interested in so for example one of my nursing students created an infographic that is based on the critique of two other infographics that are already there on the topic of COVID I mean COVID-19 um, welcome from home um, uh, from my home office right um, it's been a huge thing and it somewhat negatively and greatly impacted lots of students in academia so that person she's a nurse she really wanted to, to tell her audience general audience a little bit more about COVID um, how to prevent the spread of the virus and what technically to do so um, and you can see what she did you know she um, well number one she kind of had to um, she had to go back and look at the infographics that are already there she had to search for the information on um, the COVID uh, cases, the number of cases that currently exist in the United States, and verify the accuracy of the information, which includes looking at the information from multiple sources and making sure the information is aligned and consistent and accurate. So she also wanted to kind of visually display um, the number of cases and show what it might look like um, in a timeline. Uh, which is obviously there. In addition to that, she also wanted to inform her audience what they could do potentially um, to prevent the spread because some of the infographics that she looked at were missing that information. And in her analysis, she was very specific on uh, critiquing either the, the, the lack of information or uh, the heaviness of the information presented. So, and that's what came out of it. A combination of you know of visual data a combination of text and somewhat engaging you know mild um, visually appealing colors and infographic organization yeah so um, we just wanted to say to say thank you for watching. Um, if you have any questions, guys, about active learning, don't hesitate to email me or Mike. Um, would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Um, is there anything else, Mike? I don't think so. Uh, like Victoria said, thank you all for watching. Hope you're well, and uh, yes. hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and all of the on-demand sessions like this one. Yep. See you all. Thanks for watching. Be safe.